Well, hello, church. So, anything interesting happened in your life recently? I've broken four planes in the last month. What about you? I missed one tornado last Sunday by 10 minutes as I drove through Arkansas. Uh, either God's trying to get me in his aims a wee bit off, or you just might not want to be close to me. That's all. I would like to vent about all of this, but I have two problems. One, I couldn't do much yesterday because there were Pepperdine people on the plane. And I'm sitting there with a pocket full of free drink tokens from American Airlines. <laughs> and I had to make do with Coke Zero and some prescription medication. <laughs> and the second thing is, even though it is part of my story, it's not part of our story, and I want to talk about our story. When I was a boy, my father was a giant of a man in his wing of our religious tribe, what I charitably now call the Taliban wing of our church. <laughs> and the giants of the faith would just show up at our house as we did mission work here, there, or elsewhere. I was raised in seven countries, and so I, I don't really sound Scottish or anything, frankly. Uh, I, I'm was appalled that uh, Chris Seedman didn't make a better effort last night. <laughs> he could have at least painted his face blue somehow, you know, doing a, what he could do. But anyway, there was one time where a whole bunch of the giants of our church showed up, and my mom made beds with everything she could make beds with, and she'd run out of sheets, and so she used chart sermons. And... <laughs> And I'm glad that you know what those are, because most churches I've talked to don't. It's, it was the forerunner of a PowerPoint, where you would you'd draw on, on your nice bed sheets and then whack it with a stick frequently <laughs> as you would uh, speak. My, my, time came, my time came to go to bed, and I pulled down the, the wee blanket and looked down, and it said, Where are the dead? And I would listen to these men talk about God and theology, and I knew only one thing for certain. There was no place in this story for me. I didn't think like this. I wasn't a part of this. I wanted to be. I wanted to feel what they felt. I wanted to be interested in what they were interested in, but it wasn't in me. I grew up and uh, frittered my education away in science again and again, getting degree after degree, wastefully, going on to teach in med schools and such. I know, I know, it's a profligate life. <laughs> Yesterday on the plane, when too many people started talking to me, let me, real quick, lectureships, people fly to get to lectureships, so all the preachers stand up here and talk to you about the people they talk to on the plane. Well, good for them. <laughs> I don't. And there's a reason why. I believe in baptism. It's too late for anybody in the plane. <laughs> I'm not entirely heartless. If I find out we're hurtling toward water, I'll bring it up. But anyway, some of the Pepperdine people had spotted me, and so they were close to me, and there are some tourists from Australia uh, around, and uh, I didn't talk to them for the longest because I thought, they're going to think I'm mocking them. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like if you have a speech impediment and somebody with the same speech impediment speaks to you, you don't speak back. <laughs> so so some, some of the, the, a couple of the Australian lads said, oh, do you... You live in Nashville, and a couple of Pepperdine people said, oh, do you teach at Lipscomb now? And I said, I'm not qualified. I, I don't have a Bible degree. I'm only qualified because I wrestled God down by the river. You know, Jacob only had to do it once. I've got season tickets. 
but I'm not afraid to talk about it either. Josh Graves, my son-in-law, who I admire greatly and think he's a fantastic man, patted me on the back before I got up just now and he says, remember, they can't fire you. <laughs> That's true, so let's go, shall we? The story that always amazed me when I was a boy was, why did Jesus get baptized? I'd always been told it so you could get to heaven, and I pretty much was sure he had a ticket. He knew some people there. <laughs> and yet, John the Baptist was pretty much a little perplexed by the same thing, and Jesus said, please let me do this. I'm here for the same reason Jesus wanted to be baptized. I want to be in this story. I want to be in the river. The story that has swept from day one and has taken us amazing places. It's a river that we're in. My mom, I have an Irish mom, but we forgave her. And she, <laughs> when I was three or four years old, she looked at me and just shook her head, which I got used to later in life. <laughs> and she said, I think you're going to be our Shenaki. Now, Shenaki to the Irish is somebody who tells the stories that holds the folk together. Because story was all I was really interested in. Still am. Really just interested in the story. And as we look at our story, it always begins with water. Put yourself in the place of those that were about to cross into Canaan land, across the mighty Jordan River. It, they came at the wrong time. If you want to cross the Jordan, it's in full flood it is bashing its banks and overflowing. It's a terrifying, frothing thing. And God says, you want to follow me? You've got to go through the water. He'd done that with, his, with their, their moms and dads, but then their moms and dads got a bit frightened. And God doesn't really react well to fear. He, he, he doesn't want us to be afraid. And so he has to wait until they die. Wait until the doubters die. Then he can do something. Now the kids, and what does he do? Day one, step in the water. Just like his son would do in Matthew 3. Just like I did. Get in the water. Get in the story. Unlike other ancient people, the Israelites didn't worship rivers, but they did believe gods lived in them. And this particular river belonged to Baal, the storm god, the god of floods and rivers. This is his home turf. And God says, you want to follow me, you've got to invade the story. You've got to break into the story. Philistines believed Baal would use that river to protect them. Any enemy would be defeated by their God in the water. Israelites believed their God was the supreme God, but they believed other gods were pretty tough too. And they weren't sure about walking in the water. But let's flash back to another story, the creation story. I love the creation story. I've taught it all my life. I've got 15 different opinions about it, if you would like to ask me. <laughs> the Bible says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The contemporary English version of the Bible says it this way, The earth was barren, with no form of life. It was under a roaring ocean covered with darkness. But the Spirit of God was moving over the water. We read this. We're going, come on, come on, day one, day one. God made earth and God. No, 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 don't, don't do that. This is the big moment. This is the moment of chaos. This is a moment of terror. This is a moment of darkness and drama. This, this is a moment where water, which saves us but can also kill us, it's all there. And it's hopeless until the Spirit of God moves on the water. What, did, what happened at Jesus' baptism? The Spirit of God moved on the water. What happened at our baptism? The Spirit of God moved on the water. We wade in the water and begin our story. And this creation story, the Spirit of God has come. The Philistines thought their God was the God of, of water, so they could relax behind the barrier. They were wrong. Just like the color red in Schindler's list, water is going to show up again and again and again. It's a theme. It's a signal from God about our story. 
And it's not always going to be boundary lands, but it's often boundaries. Are you willing to cross the boundary? Are you willing to step into the water? Are you willing to join the story? Are you willing to be swept away? I had no intention of ever being a speaker. I would have taken a class. I would have read a book. I would have done, you know, I, I still, I'll, I'll hang around young ministers. And, and the Church of Christ has some of the fan, most fantastic young ministers. And they'll talk about, did you read this book? Did you read that book? And I have to keep smiling going, no, no, I didn't. No. <laughs> But I do work quite extensively in quantum physics, so in one of those alternate universes, I did. <laughs> in fact, I wrote it. So, <laughs> But I know God told me, are you willing to be swept away and let me change your story? Get in the water. The psalmist said this about the water. But you, O God, in Psalm 74, are my king from of old. You bring salvation upon the earth. It was you who split open the sea by your power. You broke the heads of the monster in the water. It was you who crushed the heads of Leviathan and gave him his food to the creatures of the desert. It was you that opened up the springs and streams. You dried up the ever-flowing rivers. It was you who set all the boundaries of the earth. And if you read this and you start thinking, oh, that's really cool, you're not reading it. You need to read it and go, what monster? What Leviathan? The Jews didn't write a great deal about Satan and demons until they'd been in Persia for a while and picked up some ideas there, but they had some ideas of false gods, some competitors, some people on the other team. I'll never forget, I took a group of 90-some people on a cruise. It was in their, the cruise line had offered us to, that they would give an awful lot of money to missions from our money, and it worked out great, long story. But they gave us a bar to worship in on Sunday. And I thought, well, that's great. You'll either get the spirit here or right back there, you know, one of the two. <laughs> I had told them for months ahead of time, we need unleavened bread and we need grape juice. Do you understand the concepts? And they got it. We got it. We're all there for you. On the day they brought out the unleavened bread, perfect, uh, tasteless, not interesting at all. They did it well. We don't want it to be the Lord's Supper. We want it to be the Lord's terribly insufficient snack. And so that's what we got. <laughs> and then they brought out a, um, I don't like a Costco-sized bottle of wine. And I stopped him. I said, oh, hang about. First of all, this is my cabin number. But the second thing <laughs> you need to know is that um, these... Where's the grape juice? They said, well, we, we thought we had it. We don't, but this will do. And I said, um, a lot of these people are from very conservative churches. This is going to be a real issue. And I, as God is my witness, they turned the bottle over and pointed to where it said kosher. And they said, but it's kosher. <laughs> I, I said, we bat for the other team. By the way, we, I went ahead, I explained the situation, the, even the conservative people understood the concept, some of them to show, you know, no harm, no foul, they came for seconds, uh, so it was, <laughs> it was fine. But the Jews knew they weren't alone, they knew there was somebody on the other team, and they were afraid of that other team, and they believed that other team lived and breathed in the water. Water was a symbol of the chaos. Some of you understand water is a symbol of chaos if you've read the Psalms, like Psalm 42. When he says, deep calls to deep and the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. For some of you, God has not swept you along in a story to a good place, but bashed you against the rocks. And water is a symbol of depression in Scripture, of being upended, of being run places you didn't intend to go. Water, everywhere you are in the story, whether you're being swept along the heights or into the darkness of depression, water shows up in the story. 
In Psalm 18, the psalmist thinks he's facing death, and then he says, the cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. He reached down from on high, and he took a hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy. If you read all the Psalms and you get all this water stuff going, you begin to realize there are several stories going on in the river. You want to make sure you're in the right river. You want to make sure you're in his story. The other will drag you down to death. This one, you get to meet the Spirit of God. Isaiah, by the way, used this, this force and depression and demon imagery in Isaiah 5 and verse 30. And that day they will, roar, they will roar over it like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks at the land, he will see darkness and distress. Even the light will be darkened by clouds. Water is a powerful thing. It was only a few weeks after Katrina that I was asked to go down to the Gulf Coast and do a youth rally. It was for all the churches, not just our church. For any kids that were there to encourage them, what do you say? What do you say when you get off the plane, you get the rental car, and every time you stop anywhere, people run up to you saying, are you with FEMA? Can you help us? Water. You don't mess with water. It's a dangerous thing. Unless it's our story, you've got to pick the right river. You know, everybody dies. You might as well matter on the way. You might as well have a life that is part of a bigger story. What about this one? O oh Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O oh Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. And if you're going, who's Rahab? Well said. It's a demon. That's all we know. At least that's what they called her. And yet, God can take care of the demons, but you've got to get in the water. I talked to a woman once who told me she didn't like her kids being near the water. And I said, why? She said, they could drown. Fair enough. And she says, I won't let them get near the water until they know how to swim. <laughs> I'm sure there are YouTube videos that one could use and <laughs> enjoy that process. We've got to get in the water, but we don't have to be afraid of the water. You see, speaking of cruise, we had one person want to come with us, but he said, my wife won't go. So I asked her, I said, what's wrong? Don't you? And she goes, oh, I, I can't sleep on a, on a ship knowing that there may be sharks swimming underneath. <laughs> I wanted to explain to her the concepts of physics and metallurgy and oceanography and how sharks have not yet developed the tools to enter the ship. <laughs> the Bible tells us, don't be afraid. S quick story. I lived in West Virginia for eight years. That's, that's why I got the accent. <laughs> and... We, we lived on top of a mountain, and, and our rule was, anybody moves on this place, we convert them or drive them off. That's our choice. So some people were moving in. So I took my son, who's now a six-foot-five Marine, but back then he was just a wee guy, and I took our primary dog with us. Well, we, have, we also had a backup dog um, <laughs> in case the primary dog ever failed to function. So with a backup dog, big 100-pound lab mix, and so we're walking down. We get fairly close, and the door opens. And out fly three chihuahuas. Angry, snarling, attack chihuahuas. Now later, we would find out that they were all in their teens. One was killed, named Killer, one was named Dynamite, and I can never remember the name of the third. I, you know, Bob, you know, whatever it was. We would we'd learn, out, learn later, one was blind, one was epileptic, and I, I guess Bob had issues, but whatever it was... They were coming at us. And first of all, my dog looked at me, and I said, don't laugh, you know. Um, <laughs> it 
We, we don't, you don't, don't need to be up here and have dogs with issues. You know, so we'll be all right. We had some time, by the way, because there was a ditch with some high grass, and they were having trouble getting through it. But they knew. <laughs> they knew once they got through, they were going to kill us and, and hide the bodies. <laughs> My son looked at me, and he goes, why do they think they can hurt us? And I said, son, there's so much about this world I don't know, but I do know dogs. We're going to stop right where we are. And we stopped, and sure enough, within a few seconds... The door opens again, and out to come two huge dogs. One's a Newfoundland Mastiff. The other was, I don't, a Clydesdale. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it was hauling a beer wagon. There were little dogs in orbit around it. And they just sat on the porch and looked at us. And I said, now you know why the wee dogs think they can kill us. When I wake up in the morning, I feel like a 13-year-old blind epileptic chihuahua. <laughs> Some of you wake up in the morning and, and, and literally say, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us read. I don't like you. <laughs> I'm not a Christian when I wake up. It takes a while. <laughs> God and I have to renegotiate the contract. And I enter the water, fair enough, shower in this case, but uh, we, I'll enter the story again but I know I've got back up because I'm in the story. And you read from Genesis through to the book of Concordance, which is the last book in my <laughs> Bible. Some of you progressives have the book of maps, but um, anyway. <laughs> we start with water in the creation story. We have water from rocks. We have crossing the Red Sea. We have crossing the Jordan. We have storm stories in the gospel. We have Jesus walking on water. There's a symbol for you. We have a miracle at a sacred pool where a spirit troubles the water on and on. Maybe there's something we should learn there. Before you enter Israel, you've got to wade in the water. You've got to step in the water. You know, the first people out front were the people carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and that was considered an honor. You get to go first. Really? Interesting. This is back in the days when generals led combat rather than sitting around the table on the other side of the pla uh, planet thinking, ooh, you know what would be a good idea? They went first. I ask myself sometimes, would I wade in the water? And there are days where I say, absolutely. And there are other days where I say, maybe. But only if I get help, I need help to do this. I, can I confess something to you? Go on to anyway. They can't fire me, Josh said. <laughs> there are a lot of times when the church sings that I don't. And it's not because I don't want to sing. It's because I need to hear. I need your faith to carry me a little bit for a while. And sometimes I'll see you and you've got tears coming down your cheeks and your hands are in the air and I'm going, I needed that. I needed to see that part of the story. It helps me remember, don't just wrestle God by the riverbank. Get in. To quote the great philosopher Delbert, <laughs> come on in, boys, the water's fine. Isn't it interesting that in the early church, they made you take off all your clothes as a symbol of dropping everything else, and they went through an exorcism before you went into the water to be baptized. They understood the power in the, of water in this story. Sometimes I'm asked by people, they'll say, you know, you're free to go at any time you want, so why are you still in Churches of Christ? And I just smile, and I say, some days I do feel like Miss Noah, another water story. I imagine that Miss Noah, after a while, got fed up got tired of the rain, got tired of rocking in the boat, got tired of the sticky walls. Whose idea was to put pitch on the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> got tired of the animals, got tired of it all. And I can almost see her looking at her husband saying, that's right, I'm out of here. <laughs> Where are you going to go? 
One of the things I love about our church is that we have restored the place of baptism. It is a sacrament we have been reminded by John Mark Hex and Bobby Valentine and Greg Taylor. And I, I owe those men so much for reading their books and learning from them that I can even say the word sacrament, which is kind of fun because <laughs> we don't normally get to say it. Now we do. And so I've told John many times, I've stolen that, but I give you credit for the steal. <laughs> uh, but I also don't give you the blame if I get it wrong. But I love the fact that it's a sacrament, and yet it's in our hands. We don't have to wait and go through this big thing to do it. We, we can actually say, come on in the water. And you can baptize your children, or I can baptize, or we can, we can, oh, Wow. I love that. Do you remember the baptism of Jesus in Matthew 3? He started his story by going into the water. In Acts 2.38, which is tattooed on every Church of Christ's body, somewhere in a secret location, it is the mark God will look for in the book of Revelation. We enter our Jordan taking our sins with us there, leaving them in the water. When we come up, the Spirit does not hover over us. He lives in us, and we are swept along. We fear no false gods. We fear no demons. We do not fear death itself. Fear for us is no longer an option, for we have gone into the water, into the river, into a story that will sweep us along with all the others who have entered the water until it sweeps us home. I look forward to that day. God bless. Cheers.